Hi, it's Jim Dodson, the Florida Bike Guy. So welcome to our live stream. Uh, this is a great program today. We're fortunate to have Barry Miller, who's the uh, Director of Outreach for the Virginia Tech Helmet Laboratory. Uh, you may have seen that. They produce a list of the safest helmets. But we're going to get in the lab with Barry and his, uh, his staff, and uh, we're going to look at what they do and why they do it. But Barry, I appreciate you joining us today from Virginia. Um, I think there's a couple of things I wanted to just address to people um, about helmets, you know. So should anyone ever ride a bicycle without a helmet? Oh, absolutely not, Jim. What's the biggest concern that your research is doing to what, what what's the big uh, problem you're trying to eliminate with the helmet research you're doing? Well, we primarily focus on concussion risk and mm -hmm. You know, there's just several studies out there and, you know, abundance of information that says any helmet is much better than no helmet. And you can right. reduce, you know, concussion risk 50% or more, most likely quite a bit more just by wearing any helmet. And certainly there's, you know, helmets that perform better than others. Um, and we'll get to that towards the end of our little virtual tour here. Um, but again, thank you for having me. Um, again, my name is Barry. And behind the camera, we actually have our director of testing, uh, Dr. Mark Begonia. So he may chime in and ask some questions or um, elaborate on a few things as we move forward. So, but yes, uh, obviously, you know, biking is probably the most predominant activity worldwide. And thus, you know, the, the injury rates for that activity are greater than any other sport. And, you know, wearing a helmet drastically reduces your uh, chances of concussion. And so, um, and we're going to get to that again, but the Virginia Tech Helmet Lab, we kind of got our, our starting with football helmets. Uh, the lab yeah. was founded in 2007. We came out with the first ever ratings for football helmets in 2011. And so if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give you a quick virtual tour. Feel free to ask questions, Jim, as we move around the room. Um, um, but let's let's highlight some of the things we do. So the lab, yeah, so have, oh, go ahead, Jim. I just want to comment. So you guys were ahead of the curve. You were at before the NFL the light went on for the NFL about all the concussion issues that they're dealing with. So Virginia Tech has been gathering data on these helmets. You'll talk about that since 2004. So they got an amazing uh, data uh, assembly of, of just, and Barry can talk about that, what they've learned. Yeah, well, what's interesting, the first set of ratings came out in 2011, and that was based on about 65,000 head impacts. And you know we've been collecting data inside football helmets uh, since 2007 or so. And at this point in time, we have over 2 million data points um, related to, you know, helmeted impacts in football. And what, what's, what makes it great is that anytime there's an on-field concussion diagnosis, well, that's paired with what the sensor data tells us inside the helmets. And so we have a really good idea of when concussions happen, both from a rotational acceleration and linear acceleration standpoint. We have these risk contours. And I think I shared some of those slides with you that kind of um, outlines that concept. And so uh, the premise of all our uh, research is head accelerations. You know, as your head um, accelerates or decelerates, just depends on which direction you're, you're um, oriented to. But as your brain moves inside your skull, it's the stress and strain on your brain as it tries to main position inside your skull, which causes uh, brain injury and concussions. So linear acceleration, right? Or rotational acceleration. Both of those cause stress and strain on your brain. And right. so your brain, people always think your brain has to hit the side of your skull. Well, that's not true. I mean, if it did, it's probably a serious brain injury versus a mild concussion. Um, but there's a whole range of, you know, mild versus severe concussions. And obviously we want to minimize those head accelerations, both linear and rotational. And that's the kind of the function of a helmet is to minimize or absorb some of that energy. And so it reduces your overall head movement. Yeah, and you know, when the first uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission standards came out in the 90s, th that was really just addressing linear acceleration from what I understand. And it had a, a drop test that just dropped it on the helmet and you know, they measured it and they were really focused on, on um, skull fractures more than concussions back in that time. That was a long time ago. Thank you, Katie. Well, that, well, that's still true. The certification standards still primarily only use linear acceleration. And the, the threshold for the pass-fail certification is, you know, a catastrophic injury, somewhere around, you know, 250 to 300 Gs of linear acceleration. And that's the point where skull fractures and death occur. Right. And so they certainly want a helmet to be able to pass 
at least that minimum catastrophic standard. Um, but obviously, you know, that's where we come in. We fill in that huge void from, you know, concussion risk or mild brain injury to catastrophic head injuries. Right, right. And, so, and, and we, we use those ratings um, to basically inform the public on the relative differences between helmets on the how well they attenuate energy and reduce your chance of getting a concussion. So one of the things you've mentioned is that rotational acceleration. So, you know, bike crashes, you know, and football, you know, the body's in motion and you don't just hit your head, you hit your head, you know, at all kinds of forces and angles. And that's the rotational acceleration component that has really come into the fore with some of the latest technology, MIPS and wave cell and some of the other people, which you'll talk about later, but it's not just Correct. linear, it's the rotation, which really has to be protected against as well. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, it's almost impossible to have a complete center of mass impact, right? Where you're just, your head moves in one, you know, and your brain is kind of oblong too. So even though it might be the center of mass of your head, there's some sort of rotational acceleration, you know, it's X, Y, Z coordinates. So um, it's impossible, nearly impossible to have a purely linear accelerated right. head you know, right. of your head. Yeah, right. Which is why so we're, right track, we're, you know. helmets are so much better today than they were 20 years ago. Oh, the advancements have been, yeah, incredible. incredible. Even in the last two years, um, it's it's been amazing to watch. And bike helmets in particular are really starting to adopt some of the technologies. Uh, football helmets obviously are probably the leader in technology. You know, in that sport, you know you're going to hit, hit your head um, just about every play. And so, um, but a lot of that technology can be applied to some of the other sport helmets and we're starting to see some of that with the bike helmets and so that's great um great for the industry great for you know everyone that participates um either leisurely or competitively in the cycling world so so why don't you standing in the football helmet department why don't you kind of walk us through what you were going to show us okay yeah great so let's so we have two mannequins here we have a football player and a hockey player and you know in football you don't want to we don't want players to be able to grab you etc right so speed is critical and so the body armor is kind of, or body padding is kind of minimal, but you can see they have a nice, robust football helmet. Again, they know they're going to get hit in the head just about every play. And on the, on the converse, we have our hockey player over here. And the hockey player has tons of body padding, right? They hit the ice, dasher boards, they check each other. And so there's a lot of body contact um, with, each, with other players as well as the environment. But the helmets are minimal. And that culture tends to think they don't have... Um, a lot of head impacts or concussion risk, but in fact they do. And so, right. so let's scoot over here. We'll move into the helmet display here. <clears throat> so this was the original helmet display. Uh, we use a star rating system. And so zero stars being bad or low performing and five star being high performing. It's really the star score that dictates what category you're in. But STAR actually stands for the summation of tests for the analysis of risk. So it's a culmination of all the head impacts that we test that contribute to the score. The score then puts you in a general five, four, three, two, one star category. But this helmet display kind of depicts some of the different padding structures they tried or have tried over the years. You know, different foams and, you know, this one's all one type of foam. This has multi-type multi uh, um, different types of foam, densities, thicknesses, um, configurations. And so that's evolved. And so I'm gonna show you, if Mark, you wanna pan out just a hair. So this is one of the latest technology helmets. Tell me when you're in view here. All right, so they, they use these little columns, which are kind of unique and different. And this helmet, this shut helmet, as well as vices kind of use similar um, applications. So you can see how the helmet designs have changed over the years and this helmet's amazing we're going to do a demonstration maybe not with this helmet but on the pendulum impactor and you'll see how well some of these football helmets attenuate high energy impacts um, we always joke in the lab that if, if i knew i was going to get into a, an accident and i was going to hit my head i'd probably put on a football helmet you you think that they have the highest technology right now in terms of uh protection football helmets current Yes, absolutely. You know, the football helmets are a little heavier than a bike helmet. And so it'd be kind of uh, difficult to wear a football helmet for an extended bike ride because they're, you know, roughly five pounds. But the technology um, and the advancements in that, that sport have been incredible. And they continue to improve. And, you know, Mark and I are always um, impressed by even just the latest helmet we tested dropped score 
um, which means concussion risk significantly beyond compared to some of the others. So right. um, they're starting to do uh, the shells of the helmet. They're starting to change like two or three piece helmet models. You know, so the idea is that the shell can absorb energy while your head maintains its position. And that's kind of the whole, as I think I mentioned before, that's the goal of a helmet. Absorb energy to minimize your head from moving, which will then minimize your head acceleration and thus minimize the stress and strain on your brain as it tries to maintain uh, position right. inside the skull. Yeah, right? that's a great explanation. Yeah. So let's uh, we'll flip around. I'll show you the hockey helmets. And I do, we do lots of tours with the K through 12 STEM students that come through in our area and I always have them compare the football helmets to the hockey helmets. And the first thing they usually say is, wow, the star scores are really bad. And I say, well, why do you think they're so bad? And they usually all say, agree really quickly. Well, there's hardly any padding, right? And so absolutely, they're absolutely right. More padding generally means more energy, energy absorption and thus, you know, less head accelerations. So again, that, that sport and that culture is dominated by, by just a few helmet companies, and they just really haven't embraced some of the technology that comes out of the football helmet industry. Um, there's a couple of new players that we're hoping they're going to enter the market and shake it up, but uh, that culture has just in general been a little resistant to embracing better helmet protection. Uh, but I get lots of emails and correspondence from hockey parents, and you know, there's only one five-star hockey helmet at this point in time, and it's pretty obvious to say, you know, compare this one to the one on the wall. This one just has a lot more padding. Right, right. So, which makes sense, right? More padding is going to be better, especially if it's a, you know, compliant type foam or rubber or whatever they use. So, um, but again, lots of technology out there they can incorporate. So, a lot of engineering, a lot of smart people are getting their, putting their engineering at use there. That's correct. All right. So, let's, uh, we'll flip around. I'll show you how we test a couple different sports and then we'll certainly end with cycling. So over here, so this is a this is a head form we use. This is an oxy head form. This is the 50th percentile human head, male human head. And so it's it's a little bit rubbery and it's a little bit more biofidelic, meaning it kind of better simulates the human head, in our opinion, for sport applications. And then inside here, we would slide the acceler accelerometer um, equipment and so that records the you know all the data that we need and then these mounting screws so we can put this helmet on just about any test rig configuration and so what we have here we call this our head-to-head -head, uh, impactor and for soccer and flag football what we do is we do a bare head-to-head -head impact and then we put the headgear on here and we do all the various uh, locations and energy levels again and what we basically do is compare how well does the headgear reduce some of those head accelerations compared to the bare head model. And so, and if you do that, right, then you kind of, we plug it into our risk function with all those concussion data, and that kind of determines, you know, your concussion risk and how well the headgear performs. So we do um, soccer, flag football. Um, we also baseball, softball. We have a big cage that goes over this whole apparatus. And then we put catchers and softball headgear on here and we shoot baseballs and softballs point blank at the head forms. Um, and so that's another way we use this test setup. So pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah. So we'll move on. So that's that's how we do um, those sports. For our soccer parents, uh, is there a soccer helmet currently? Oh, yeah. So these there's a couple of them. So this is a, a impact sports. So it's soft. We call them soft headgear. And so there's all types of soft headgear. Vices is one of the football helmets. They also make this soft headgear for flag football. But there's soccer headbands. And so these go around your forehead and you know cover the back of your head a little bit. So there's headbands and then there's these full soft headgear pieces. So, and these are kind of becoming a little bit more um, commonplace. And it's typically the kids that have already had a concussion that really start right. to wear these. Yeah. And so, but they're very compliant. And what, you know, in our test protocol, we only put the headgear on one of the head forms. And so those results are based on just one person wearing the headgear. However, if it was mandatory, which we think it certainly should be, should be, that all players wear some sort of headgear, then you have twice the padding and henceforth the, you know, the risk of concussion would even further be reduced. Right, right. So we're... We work with a couple uh, soccer organizations, and you know they're all looking to implement 
you know, headgear, at least headbands. You know, it's usually the head-to-head -head, uh, impacts in soccer and flag football that cause concussions. Uh, you know, two hard, relatively hard surfaces. The ground can, but, you know, the grass is fairly compliant. Um, knees, elbows, things like that. But head-to-head, -head, particularly in soccer, as two players go up and try to head the ball, um, seems to be the most common type of right. head injury in that yeah. sport. Yeah. It's a little surprising to me that they haven't been more uh, open to moving to the headgear in soccer. Well, I think as an attorney, Jim, you might think from uh, you know a legal perspective or insurance perspective, you know, if you could reduce your risk and your insurance premiums just by simply making players wear a headband, which is not going to change the game in any form, that would just, I think the underwriters would love that, I would think. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. So I think it's coming. I just... It's going to take one organization to adopt it. Um, you know, a lot of the youth organizations already forbid the younger players from heading the ball just because even though the ball is fairly compliant, you know, a young player, that ball has a lot of mass. And so um, so they've eliminated that from a lot of the games and practices, yeah. 12 and under, some of the organizations. So, Good. Yeah. So you I'm going to flip around here. Go ahead, Jim. You had a question? No, I was saying, when you see concussions on, as we see them, anything you can do to eliminate them is what needs to be done. They're, right. life, they're life changing. So we, this is our pendulum impactor. We use this to test football and hockey helmets. And it's a pendulum because certainly this arm comes up, we have a little magnet, and then we have an impactor face that hits the helmet. And what we like about this test setup is if we take this pendulum arm up to the same angle, we get the same velocity at impact. So it's very reliable source of energy versus you know, some of the pneumatic and gas powered ones. That, there's a lot of variation in pressure. Um, so we, we think this is the gold standard. And then we have a, a head form on our little sliding mast here. And so we can orient this head form any way we want. And so on the wall here, Mark can zoom in a little bit. You'll see all the different locations we use for hockey and football. And so this, this apparatus allows us to do that. Yeah, And so cool. what I'm going to show you here, we're going to do a high energy impact. And without a helmet on, this would be skull fracture and death. For that head form but when we put a helmet on this head form it'll take that 300 g plus hit down to 120 130 maybe even less with some of the brand new helmets which may be a concussion but certainly not skull fracture or death and you know 130 you might even not have a brain injury at all so so we're going to fire it up here this is the highlight of the tour when the kids are here they love to see this Looks pretty. Uh, I wouldn't want to be the head form. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. Mark will probably, yeah, we could probably do this twice just to see, but hopefully watch the head form in particular. So three, two, one, here we go. Oh gosh. Yeah. That's a, that's a big, that's a big impact. Lots that's of energy impact. there. And that, that energy level we use for the high energy is hopefully only, um, an impact a player gets a couple times a season, um, but certainly they're there. You know, that's like the DB and the running back, both running full speed and the head-to-head -head collision, maybe a linebacker. Um, we have three energies we use, and the 65% one yeah, is very mo moderate, but, you know, happens all the time. And so we yeah. use a variety of energies and locations to best represent um, any given sport. And so did you want to see that again, or are we good for that? I think we're good. Okay. That's, uh, that's pretty impressive. All right, so we'll move on here. Let's go this way, Mark. So this, we were talking about the industry certification standards, and these are basic drop towers. So linear acceleration measured only. So this pops straight up, and then just drops onto a steel anvil. Um, no rotational acceleration values are recorded. Um, and part of that's they don't have the data that we have to actually utilize it. You know, when does rotational acceleration cause, you know, catastrophic injury. And we don't know all that yet. Right. And so, but that's how these, these are kind of our test setups. Just so if you ever want to do a standard certification test or evaluation of a helmet in that context, we, we can do that and perform those tests. So, yeah. all right. So now we'll get to the fun part. We'll get to talk about bike helmets.
Oh, we're already down. So one of the questions people would have is, um, how many helmets do you rate a year? Bike helmets. Ooh, uh, unfortunately, testing bike helmets is the, there's the most number of helmets in any sport we do is our bike, our cycling helmets. Right. And it's also the most tedious of all of our testing procedures. So uh, we do as many as we can, but it, again, it takes a lot of time. And there's been so much change in the bike helmets with the inclusion of MIPS and some of the other rotational mitigating technologies. And so we're trying to do the latest, greatest. Um, we have an extensive to-do list, but some of those are already obsolete even in the past six months. So uh, I don't know, I would, how many, Mark, would you say? Yeah. 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 Maybe more depending on what, what other testing has gone on in the lab because this doesn't happen always in parallel. Right. So, so yeah, do we don't just do bike helmets and we do, actually just don't do helmet injury research. We do all types of uh, injury yeah. biomechanic research. Uh, but I should let the, um, the viewers know that the ratings on for all the sports are kind of on, on a rolling basis. So as we test and rate helmets, the website gets updated and we're now starting to include the testing year and dates of some of the models. Um, because obviously when we first launched them, that was the only ones available, but we're, we're starting to do that. So people have an idea of, oh, when was this tested rated? What model year was it? Um, Cause some of the models and names don't change much, uh, even though the year manufacturer year has changed. Now, so, and with technology coming out like it is in the bike world, I mean, you can look at the uh, helmet list that you have in the top 10 this year and be different than last year, you know, because right, right. currently, well, I will talk about that, but um, it, it you know, we'll talk about that and why they need the five star anyway. Right. Sure. So for our bike helmet testing protocol, if you were to crash on your bike, usually you would crash at some sort of angle, right? So your bike's moving horizontally, you're falling vertical off your bike. And uh, Dr. Megan Bland was our PhD student that kind of worked on this whole bike star rating protocol. And so we determined roughly it's generally around 45 degrees. And so, you know, it's really hard to create a, um, a test rig that shoots at 45 degrees. So what we've done is we inverted the whole thing. So we like to use gravity again. So if we take a helmet up to a certain height, we know that the velocity and impact is going to be very consistent. So we invert this. So we drop vertically, but we drop onto a 45 degree anvil. And then we even put a piece of sandpaper on the anvil to simulate road grit. And so that's how we test. And here's roughly what we do. So we put this helmet on, on the halo, all right? And so the halo goes around the anvil. And so then the helmet hits the, the anvil and drops into our little foam um, pad area here. So let me take this up a little bit and we'll show you a test. And I'll do a moderate energy just so, just so you can see the whole fall. Let me know when it's out of view, Mark. Still good? Can I go up a little higher? All right. All right. So again, this halo will drop down around the anvil, the helmet, and it's un we have an unsupported neck. We figured we thought, um, based on all the research, this was the best way to test uh, bike helmets. And so the helmet and the head form will hit the anvil and bounce away. But again, even at a moderate level, this is a pretty high energy impact and certainly, you know, high probability of a concussion. So here we go. Three, two, one. Oh yeah. So that yeah, that's a lot of that's a it's a lot of energy to absorb, and you know for those that are unaware, you know the helmets we test have to be CPSC certified. Um, that's true for all of our sports, and for any helmet to be sold in the United States for any purpose, it has to be certified by some organization, and those certifications, as we mentioned before, are on a pass fail basis. Bike helmets have to pass the Consumer Product Safety Committee test. Um, and it's a pass fail test, but bike helmets are a little different than, you know, the football helmets that we showed you earlier. These are single impact helmets. So as a helmet is impacted, the type of foam that's EPP foam is designed to crush, crumble and break on impact. So after you've had one accident, you know, it's best to probably replace that helmet because it's not going to perform the way it was tested or designed to do previously. Right. Um, but these helmets are quite effective in attenuating that energy. Um, particularly on the high energy impacts is they crush, crumble and break. Uh, I don't think they do as well on the lower energy. Um, certainly there has to be a certain magnitude of energy before that 
foam starts to break, crumble and break. And, you know, even the low energy can cause concussions. So, right. um, so I think some of that technology from football will start to get better integrated in the bike helmets. And that so might that's mean a basic, little, you're talking about just a basic uh, foam helmet you have in your hand. Correct. And so uh, the helmets might get a little bigger, a little heavier, but I think that, you know, for as far as protection goes, it's probably a wise choice. And so, so I'm going to show you, you've, you've asked this question before in a previous conversation we had. So you guys have probably heard of MIPS, multi-impact, um, multiple impact uh, directional protection system, MIPS. And so what that really is, is a little slip plane in here. So this kind of moves. Let me see if I can move it with my fingers. So that kind of slides around and moves. Yeah, so I mean, I didn't move. So that's a better one. And the idea behind that is if your head can remain stable and allow that helmet to rotate and move a little bit, that better protects you, you know, from a brain injury. It's interesting to me, Mark, because uh, I mean, Barry, the, um, the, 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 the movement is very slight. You, you're measuring it in millimeters, right? Sure. And it's just interesting to me that that slight protection in millimeters would make a difference in terms of uh, concussion protection. Oh, that's a great question. So these head impacts, we're talking five to 10 milliseconds in a helmeted or two hard surfaces. So if you think about how a helmet has to attenuate that energy in such a short amount of time, any you know, assistance in rotational right. linear acceleration is gonna have a pretty dramatic effect. Okay, and, great explanation. Well, yeah, and if you think about the big scheme, well, that's a challenge for a helmet to attenuate energy in five to 10 milliseconds. And so they're a very abrupt, you know, and to put it in perspective, if you guys blink your eyes, you know, that's 20 to 30 milliseconds. And so five to 10 milliseconds is really quick. Really fast. Yeah. And so, uh, so MIPS, there's wave cell, there's omnidirectional, there's, there's a bunch of different rotational mitigating technologies out there. This one happens to be, let me think it's, there's a little SP on here. I'm not sure if they're still using that exact designation, but stands for spherical MIPS. Okay. So, so what this is. I haven't seen that. So can you guys see that? So oh, yeah. basically it's a two piece helmet. So I'm moving the inner layer independent of the outer shell. Right, so that's kind of the same principle as what the MIPS, the standard MIPS does, which is just provide a slip plane. And so some of the prototypes and some of the technologies, some of the companies are using these multi-piece multi, multi -piece shells, you know, so that that can absorb energy and the rest of the helmet can stay stable, um, you know, along with MIPS and slip planes. And, and I'm sure you guys have seen some of the, the wave so cell. Is, is that multi-piece hit the market? Are, they, are, are manufacturers putting them out on the market yet? That one is, yeah, so. Yeah, so Mark said there's about three if you guys heard that. So, um, and there's also some three dimensional helmets that are in prototype design. So, we'll see where that goes and takes us. It'll be interesting to see how that performs as an overall system or a helmet. And so, you guys have all seen Wave Cell, you yes. know, kind of a different, different kind of instead of EPP foam, they use this um, weave of kind of a plastic rubberish right. type material. And that's designed to absorb, you know, both linear and rotational acceleration because it, it bends and twists a little easier than maybe the EPP foam. So. so it's interesting. So currently on your website, the top 10 helmets, seven of them are MIPS and three of them are wave cell. Now I picked top 10 arbitrarily because those were just the top 10 scorers. Right. And talk about that just a minute. Um, so I know that you, 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 you really want a five-star helmet correct? Yeah. So the score determines, again, what star category you're going to be in. But those scores, you know, the one star to a five star, there's a big difference yeah. in reducing concussion risk. And so in some of the price, price don't always determine how well the helmet performs, you know, until we actually get it on the test and um, check it out. We don't know for sure. Um, but certainly the five star helmets are much better than a one star, two star helmet. And, you know, most of the helmets coming out nowadays, I don't think they can compete in the marketplace um, for the, you know, the avid cyclist if they're not in the four or five star category. And I think and you'll start- to... There's a lot of five star helmets. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And so um, give us an idea of the concussion mitigation of a five star helmet. If, if, can you do that in a general range? So the, the score um, for bike helmet testing, that kind of represents the average number of concussions you would get wearing that helmet if you're exposed 
to the 47 concussion related impacts in the research. So I think so the highest look, score, the lowest score you have right now was like 9.2 maybe? Correct, correct. Okay, so what does that mean? So yeah, on average you'd get 9.2 concussions wearing that helmet if you're exposed to the 47 concussion related um, impacts that the research showed that we measure against. Right. So out of those, so out of those you're measuring against yeah, you're measuring against big numbers because the average rider may have one event like that in their lifetime, if ever, right? right. So it's like right. when that one event happens, you want the highest opportunity to avoid a concussion. Without a doubt. Yeah. Correct. And so, and you know, it's kind of tricky. So every every head impact or every accident is unique in nature, um, but we've designed roughly six locations at two different energy levels to provide the most robust sampling size of accidents that typically occur. And th this research comes from uh, damage replication studies. So helmets are damaged in an accident. We get the report. Um, we recreate the damage in the lab here. And so that kind of helps determine what kind of velocities, angles, acceleration values that the helmet received that caused the concussion. And so that's kind of where all that research comes from because you know, it's not like football where we can put sensors inside a bike helmet and follow you around and hope you fall off your bike so we can collect data. So um, very, very interesting. I've got a bike crash locally and um, I give uh, a, an A plus for ingenuity to the adjuster, but she pointed out, hey, your client was wearing a MIPS helmet. He can't have a concussion. And I'm like, you find out where that manufacturer represents it. You will not get a concussion from a MIPS helmet. You know, it doesn't exist. It's Correct. mitigation, not elimination. Right. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we haven't got there yet anyways, and I don't think we'll ever get there completely, but, you know, the helmet technology is improving rapidly and, you know, the energy that they absorb is, is tremendous. And so um, they're getting better. I wanted to show you one other unique thing. So this is called the hub ding. So it's a little air, a little kind of fanny pack that goes around your neck and it's an airbag helmet. Now, these yeah, are I've, sold seen those, I've seen those marketed. Yeah. So this, this would be around my neck in this little fanny pack. And at a certain threshold, uh, this inflates in one millisecond. It almost explodes. I mean, when we were setting this off just to try to test it and play around with it, it we both jumped. Megan and I just both jumped. It's like, pow, inflates really big, really fluffy, but it protects your head and your neck. So it's highly effective. Um, it's not CPSC certified in the United States yet. For one, I don't think they know how to test it. Right. Um, but we see this in some other sports, like equestrian sports. They use this in, in bull riding. They have it in their vests. So if they get launched from the horse, you know, this at a certain acceleration um, threshold, it'll actually expand and, you know, helps protect some vital organs. Uh, you'll see this in uh, maybe incorporated in other types of helmets. In addition to the regular helmet, maybe there's another small airbag that goes off to add further protection. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. They're a little bit expensive. I think we you can buy them on Amazon for, I don't know, 250 bucks or so, um, but highly effective. I mean, it, it pumps up pretty big, pretty pretty thick, and, you know, protects a large portion of your head. So that's available currently for cyclists in the, in the United States? Well, it's not CPSC certified right, in the United right. States. But you can buy it. You can buy it in, through, on Amazon, um, right. of Ding. So it's interesting. We'll, we'll see where that goes, some of the inflatable helmet technologies. It's so. kind of weird uh, thinking about riding with nothing on your head and relying on that to explode at the right time is a little freaky to me. Yeah. So does it go off when you want it to go off? Exactly. Or does it go off when you didn't want it to go off? Which could be, yeah, like I said, it almost explodes. It's loud and one millisecond. So it certainly yeah. inflates in time if the, the right. threshold net in the sensor works correctly. Right. Uh, so uh, other sports, we're working on equestrian helmets and snow sports. So we're working with the USA ski team uh, for freestyle uh, equestrian. And then in equestrian, we're working with the United States Equestrian Federation and the United States Hunter Jumper Association. And equestrian helmets, and if you think about cycling and equestrian, so, you know, horses run up to 40 miles an hour. Your head's already, you know, nine feet, 10 feet off the ground. And so some of those injuries are severe. Um, but the technology they use is very similar to bike helmets. And so we're getting ready to launch a study and on uh, on equestrian helmets. And so this is one. So you can kind of see it's pretty lightweight. And you can, I don't know if you can't, the foam's kind of protected by some uh, comfort material. But yeah, so EPP foam for the most part. So we're getting ready to launch that study here soon. So we keep trying to add sports to our list to better inform the public and 
keep all the sports as safe as, as safe as we can. Well, you know, Mark, I mean, uh, I always keep saying Mark, Barry, it's been really, really interesting. Um, uh, this is not live. And so we're not going to, we don't have questions on the, uh, on the air for people, but I'm sure people will have, have questions, which will maybe feel through you guys. Um, one thing I'd like to point out, you, you're totally independent. I know that uh, these helmets are provided to you by the industry. Is that correct? Yeah, we technically we buy the, the bike helmets on the open market, um, but okay. we do offer licensing agreements. So certain companies, if they sign the no fee licensing agreement, they're allowed to use our, our logos, like the five four-star logos on their packaging and marketing materials. Okay. And, and the idea behind that is, they'll get us the latest greatest helmet so we can keep the consumers and keep ourselves relevant because it's really hard to keep up with um, yeah. we want to certainly test what the consumers are really getting and so, we so uh, you and i talked earlier and, and what's happened is that the the industry has really come alive in terms of its development of helmet technology they want to mitigate concussions uh they're doing a lot of research on it and i think it's a reminder for all of us that you need to not just get comfortable with wearing the same helmet for three or four years because i guarantee you that helmet is way out of date you need to step it up to the next level because you you have that one event hopefully never but that one event is the one you want to prevent yeah Unfortunately, even one concussion can have lasting effects the rest of your life. So Absolutely. You, yeah. you are correct. Yep. We have a ton, ton of data on that. Yeah. So anything else you'd want to add before we sign off? It's been really, really interesting, fascinating program. And I very much appreciate you and Mark making yourselves available for us today. Our, our pleasure. And yeah, if there's, if there's follow-up questions, you know, my email is on the little PowerPoint, bmiller21 at vt.edu. Happy to answer questions and uh, chime in where we can help. Well, maybe we'll have a follow-up program in a little while and see what's new on the market. Um, but I very much appreciate all of you, each of you making yourselves available for us today. I'm Jim Dodds from the Florida Bike Guy. So we've got a special passion for representing, helping cyclists. If you get hurt, you need me anywhere in the state, call, I'll be there. Uh, Barry and Mark, thank you again. And um, y'all be safe out there. You're Take welcome. Care. Happy thank holidays. You. Yeah. Bye.